All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Sounds like it's a New Year's Day. That was what that greeting was right there. Yeah, morning. Is, yes, it was a late night. Um, Happy New Year. Um, New Year is, um, I've never really been one to celebrate New Year's Eve a whole lot. Um, our family, we kind of, when we lived in Africa, New Year's was a big deal. And like a really big deal. They would do a New Year's Eve service um, instead of big Christmas Eve service. And we're talking like a five-hour service. Usually we didn't make it to the end. It was kind of intense. Um, But New Year's is this time where we reflect on the past. We look forward to the future. Um, During these New Year's Eve services, a lot of times they would do these testimonies about people reflecting on what God had done through their life. And a lot of the testimonies, you know, God blessed them. And a lot of them started with hardship or, you know, tragedy. And, but how God really saw them through and, and get them through, it was this beautiful thing to listen to. And, and quite often they would even give an offering. The biggest offering of the year was New Year's Eve, where people would reflect on the goodness of God. And they would respond with generosity because of what God had done for them. And it was this beautiful thing. In our culture, we tend, you know, Instagram or Facebook may give you that, you know, slideshow with 10 photos or you kind of look at and you go, wow, that really happened this year. That feels like it was so long ago. But that's about the amount of time we actually spend on reflecting on the past. We have a tendency to really look to the future. We love what is new. Um, we love to look forward. We like to think about the new habits, the new, you know, exercising, eating better. I'm a reflection of that, I think, um, this month. There's a reason my shirt's not tucked in now. Um, and we look to the future. We like what is new. And so I thought, you know, Happy New Year's. Let's talk about what's new. Embracing God's new for you. You know, where is God leading us? Because I can't help but really have this sense that God is moving and he is preparing for something new for our church family, for my family, for you, for all of us in moving forward. And like I said, we like to talk about what's new. New brings this sense of hope. Um, It brings um, a chance that things are going to get better. And so we're really gonna embrace this What is that next step? Um, Usually I'm looking for something new to make my life better, more comfortable, or what's going to help me be more successful. Um, But sometimes God's new for you is anything but that. A lot of times, if we're honest, God's new for us is leading us into discomfort to do something that I've never done before, or something that's a little scary. Sometimes it's definitely, you know, and you know, at that first step, sometimes it doesn't seem better. And then also sometimes it's, it is not how the world would define success. Sometimes maybe it's stepping into something where there's a pay cut. Sometimes it's, you know, moving somewhere and it doesn't make sense to other people. But what is God's new for you? What is God's new for us as a church family? And God's new doesn't always start with this big, grandiose step of faith. A lot of times it doesn't start with some grand gesture or even a voice calling from heaven, hey, I want you to go here, you know, Um, It's easy for us to kind of think that way because as we read scripture a lot of times, we see these big miraculous events, especially if you're reading Genesis and and then you're reading Exodus and and reading these stories of God speaking and and God literally doing these massive miracles. and And I think sometimes we can start to believe that if God really wants me to do something, he'll make it abundantly clear, right? But this is why I love the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. 
And that's going to be our story today. We're actually going to talk about the whole story of Ruth today. It's because the book of Ruth is kind of in between this time period. You have Genesis, and as you see, the life of Abraham and his family becoming you know, a nation, and you have the Exodus story where they're being called out and saved, and then becoming a covenant people. And then the book of Judges, you know, is just a hot mess of, you know, Israel just being kind of directionless and giving themselves over and saying, trying to figure it out, worshiping other gods and, and having trouble with the people around them and wars and, and things, and it is just not going well for the people of Israel. And in this transition, in, in the way the book of Ruth starts is it says, in the days of the judges. So it lets us know, this, was, this should be like, okay, it's not just, okay, the judges were around. It was like, no, this was a rough period in the history of Israel. This was during a dark period of Israel that this story of Ruth happens and I love the story of Ruth um, because it's not about these miraculous life-altering events for the people of Israel. But it answers the question of how God is involved in the day-to-day -day joys and hardships of our lives. There's no big miraculous event. There's no big, you know, life-altering event for the nation of Israel. It's a snapshot of this family and how God is involved in this family, in, in bringing things together. And I appreciate this because when we read, you know, Exodus and Leviticus and, and you have these big things, but then in the story of Ruth, the only mention of God is by the people themselves. It's Naomi and Ruth and Boaz. And they talk about God and their faith in God. The narrator of the story doesn't mention God once. You don't see God's involvement or this is what God thought about this or God spoke. You don't have this in the story of Ruth. And I think the story of Ruth feels very much like our story. And the reality is for the people of Israel in, in the past, the story of Ruth is what their life was more like. Most of the time, it wasn't these big miracles. It wasn't some oracle from God, you know, and, and speaking. Those were special moments that were recorded. But the day-to-day -day life of faith, of trusting in God, and, and doing, trying to do what's right, this is what the book of Ruth does for the Old Testament. It goes, here's, here's some of the reality check. This is what it looks like to follow God, to be faithful to him, and what God does through that faithfulness of his people. There are three main characters in this story. There's Naomi the widow. There's Ruth the Moabite. Okay, we'll talk about that. And then there's Boaz, the farmer. No big king. These are pretty simple people. Pretty simple people. Naomi the widow. For a widow in those days, life would have been extremely hard, especially for a widow who has lost her sons. Naomi is probably in her 60s, maybe older. Ruth the Moabite, so Ruth is likely in her 20s. Young woman, newly married, newly widowed, living with a foreign mother-in-law in her own land. And the Moabites, this is key to this story. The Moabites were the ancient enemies of Israel. All the way back into the days of Moses, when the Israelites were going, heading towards the promised land. And the, this is hundreds of years after that story. About eight generations, at least, have passed since those days. So when you, in Israel, you talk about the Moabites, nothing good is being said about the Moabites. It's so important to recognize, so Ruth, and throughout this story, she's called Ruth the Moabite, okay? So this is not like a, oh, that's a nice, no, that was not a good tag on for most of the time. 
And finally, you have Boaz the farmer, who this normal guy, he's a farmer, he owns land, he has workers who work for him. And everybody seems to respect, and he wants to do the right thing all the time. And he's probably in his 40s. That's probably how old he is. So let's get into the the story of Ruth. It starts out, like I said, in the days of the judges, which you're supposed to go, ooh, that was a rough time. That was a rough time for Israel. And you have this man named Elimelech. You can say that you know, five times. Elimelech and his wife, Naomi. And there's a famine in Israel. And so they decide with their two sons that we're gonna move to an area. They leave Israel during the famine. They go to Moab. Probably wasn't a popular decision with their family. And so they go to Moab with the sons. And during the time there, and their sons are probably at least younger or grown. And they're living in Moab. And during this time, uh, Elimelech dies. So you got Naomi and her two sons. And so Naomi finds wives for her sons and does that. And not long after they have the wives, Naomi's two sons die. Naomi finds herself in a foreign land with no children, no grandchildren, and two daughters-in-law who are supposed to be under her care. And she hears that things are better in Israel. And so Naomi decides, I'm going to go back to Israel. I'm gonna go back to my homeland. And she knows that she has, I mean, she does not know what's gonna happen. She knows it's gonna be hard to be accepted again. And so she tells this to her daughters-in-law. She says, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. And may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So Naomi loves her daughters-in-law. Naomi, in this story, it seems like Naomi's a great woman, very kind, very loving, very, very generous. And she looks at her daughters-in-law and says, you all need to stay because young Moabite women, if you go to Israel, the likelihood that things are gonna go well for you, it's not good. So just go back home and I pray that the Lord will provide a husband. He'll provide a life here for you because it's gonna be easier for you in Moab. And both daughters-in-law go, no, Orpah and Ruth, um, and they go, no, we're going to stay with you. They, you know, they love Naomi. And Naomi goes, okay, are you going to wait around till I have another child, another son, and then you're going to marry him? It's like, no, I'm an old woman. Go back. Go back to your homes so that you may find a husband. They're still young. And so Orpah goes back home. Sad. But Ruth, this is incredible, because Ruth refuses to go. And this is what she says to Naomi. She says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And this is your line. Your God. Your God will be my God. Ruth makes this decision that not only do I love Naomi, but I see the faith of Naomi. I've seen this. And and she is stepping into this faith. I want to be a part of your people. I want want to follow your God. And I am not going to leave you. I'm going to stay with you. And Naomi understands, okay, I mean, what's she going to do, fight her? You know, she's going to, you know, push her away. She can't. And so she accepts this incredible loyalty and generosity of Ruth. And they go back to Bethlehem in Judah, in Israel. And they arrive during the barley harvest. It is the time of year. And Naomi 
to give you how intense Naomi felt, where her relationship with God was, she tells her friends and family who remember her, she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. I've changed my name to Mara. And Mara means bitter. And she said, because the Lord has turned against me. I mean, she can imagine the depth of that, that the Lord has turned against me. I think she believes that because we went to Moab, because we, we left, God has turned against me. He no longer looks well upon me. But even in the midst of this, she is seeking the good of those who are close to her, those who she loves. In chapter two, we see Ruth go to Naomi and she, she says, okay, we need some food. So I'm going to go to the fields, they're harvesting, and I'm just gonna see what they'll let me gather. And so Ruth goes out to the fields and begins to gather grain. Um, and everybody who sees her goes, who is that? That's the Moabite, okay? That's the Moabite that came back with Naomi. And this was not a, this would not have been a good, you know, tagline to be called the Moabite. And so she's in the fields and she is working hard. And she's gathering grain for her. And she happens to find herself in one of the fields. She doesn't know where she's going. Um, but she finds herself in the fields of Boaz. And Boaz comes along. The day is going along. Um, she's been there all day long. And he's coming in to check on his workers who are harvesting. And he notices this young woman who's working hard off by herself and asks, says, oh, who is that? And they go, oh, that's the Moabite girl who was with Naomi who came back. And at the, by this time, Boaz, he's a, she doesn't know this, but Boaz is a part of Naomi's family. And he's like, oh, I've heard about her. Hey, be kind to her. Be kind to her. Leave a little extra on the ground, okay? Do not chase her off. And so they're like, okay, you're the boss, man. And, and so it comes to the meal time, the break time. And Boaz not only, and so even, well, even during this, after he says, be kind to her, Boaz goes to Ruth. He makes a point. He doesn't just talk to his workers. He goes to Ruth and says, you are welcome. I appreciate what you are doing. I appreciate how you have cared for Naomi. You know, our sister, our cousin. And, and don't go anywhere else. Wherever we're harvesting, follow us and nobody will bother you. You will be safe here. And he reassures Ruth and she's grateful. And even during the mealtime then, um, he invites Ruth because he's like, she ain't got nothing. So he invites Ruth. He says, here, come sit with me. And he shares his meal with Ruth. And sh just showing her, being very intentional to show her kindness, to care for her, to provide for her. And even it's kind of like, here, here's a little extra. Take that back home. And, at the, and Ruth continues to work all day long and goes back home with Naomi and retells the story to Naomi. And Naomi is just thrilled. She's like, the Lord, blessed be the Lord, because he has provided where you went is not only like our kin, but he is what's called the guardian redeemer. He is the one who can, like one of them in our family, that it's supposed to really look out for us. And I understand that God has led you to somebody who can really provide. And she's excited because she sees an opportunity. And so a couple of weeks probably go by and Ruth keeps going out to the fields to harvest and, and to gather. And Naomi, one morning, goes, okay, so let's make a plan here, okay? Because um, you living here by yourself is okay, I appreciate it, but you need to find a home. Not just, you know, hey, I need to find your husband. You need to find a home. You need to find a place of safety. And she starts to give Ruth instructions on what to do. Um, and remember, this isn't Ruth's culture. She doesn't know what she's doing. 
Without Naomi's guidance, without Naomi's help, she, you know, she can do all kinds of wrong things and, and things that would be misunderstood. And so Naomi um, tells her, you know, what to do in order to present herself to Boaz. Because guardian redeemer, um, what this was in the Israelite culture, um, this was the guy who, if something happened to a young widow and they didn't have children, and, and they, this is how they provided for the young women, the guardian redeemer would be the one who was set aside to be able to marry Ruth. And there were, within a big family, there have been a couple different guardian redeemers. And so this is who Boaz, and Naomi's like, okay, this is a good guy, and let's make a plan here. And so he gives instructions, he's like, okay, first, take a bath, because you've been working in the fields. All right, this is like the first instruction. And clean yourself up really good. Put on perfume, so you look good, and you smell good, and now you're gonna go find Boaz. And so Ruth does what Naomi does. She's like, okay, you know, and, and does this. And Naomi knows where Boaz is going to be. Boaz is going to be in the threshing floor with starting to process the grain, kind of keeping watch over the grain so it doesn't disappear, get stolen. And Boaz is by himself there. And Ruth goes and basically in the middle of the night presents herself to Boaz, but in a very respectful way. She, she goes and, and sits at his feet. And to us, it sounds weird. It uncovers his feet, okay? But she's there at his feet. And in that culture, it was pretty much saying, I'm asking you to take care of me. I'm, I'm asking you if you would be willing to, to marry me. And Boaz, in the middle of the night, is, is there and he wakes up, he's startled and he sees, it's, it's dark. He's like, oh, somebody's here, okay? And, and wakes up and he's like, who's there? And she's like, don't worry, it's just me, Ruth. It's me, Ruth. And he's like, oh my gosh. Okay, well, what can I do for you, Ruth? You know, why are you here? And this is what Ruth says. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. This is basically Ruth's way of saying, I want you to cover, to take care of us, and I'm hoping that you will marry me. And Boaz is just shocked and honored by this request. It would have been very easy for Boaz to take advantage of Ruth in this moment. It would have been normal in those days of the judges for a man to take advantage of a young girl in this position. That had become the norm. And Boaz looks at Ruth and he demonstrates incredible integrity and he compliments Ruth by telling her, don't be afraid. I will do for you all I will do for you all that you ask. And all the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. That you are honorable, that you are noble. You ever heard that phrase before, a woman of noble character? This is what Proverbs 31 describes. Is, is the woman who seeks God, who cares for her family. And this is what Boaz calls Ruth. You are a woman of noble character. And so he says, I will do for you. I, yes, it would be my honor because you could have gone after, it's like, hey, you're a pretty woman. You're beautiful. You're a great woman. And you could have had any young man in town, anybody you could have gone to, but you came to me. And I thank you for giving me this honor. But there's a guardian redeemer that's more closely related to you. And I'll, I'll take care of it, but go back to Naomi and he, you know, fills up her shawl. It's like, Here, here's some food, take it back. Um, and he's already providing for them. And so the next day, Boaz goes to the town square. He calls the elders together and he calls the other guardian redeemer. And he says, hey, by the way, 
uh, you know, Naomi's back and, you know, she needs to be cared for. And so her fields are for sale. And, you know, would you like to buy back the fields so you can provide for Naomi? And, and he's kind of like, let's soft play this. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, sure. That sounds like a good deal. He's like, hey, I get more land. All right. And Boaz goes, oh, by the way, you got to marry the Moabite. And the guy goes, yeah, I'm not sure right now is a good business time for me to take on the fields. And so he turns it down. And Boaz immediately looks to the elders and says, I will marry her. It will be my honor and I will take on Ruth. And he makes this pronounce, pronouncement to everybody. And Ruth and Boaz, they get married. And God blesses them with a son. And the son is named Obed. What a great name. Anybody named their kid Obed late, recently? Um, and they named their son Obed. And the story of Ruth ends with Naomi receiving back what she had lost. And the, all the women of town are celebrating to be able to see how God has provided, how God, even in the midst of tragedy, has provided and kind of brought wholeness back to this family. And it ends with Naomi receiving and says, then Naomi took the child into her arms and cared for him and loved this child deeply. And so this beautiful story, like we said, there's no direct intervention of God. There's no voice from God saying, go back to Bethlehem, okay? Or Boaz, hey, go talk to Ruth. But it's a beautiful story of how God interacts with his people through their faithfulness and his faithfulness and how he brings about these things. So what do we learn from the book of Ruth? What can we learn First, when we look at Naomi and the story of Naomi, her life turned incredibly tragic. To be found, imagine being in a foreign land and you lose your husband, you lose your sons. What do you do? The heartbreak to change your name to bitter to feel and tell people, I feel like God has turned against me. I know there have been moments in my life where I have felt that, that heartbreak, that why is this happening to me? Where is God in the midst of this? And even though this is what Naomi is feeling, she still seeks to honor God. She still sought what was best for those who she cared for and those who are around her. She looks at her daughters and is like, look, my life is hard, but that doesn't mean your life has to be hard. A lot of times our human nature, when our life is hard, what do we do? We snap. Our frustration spills out on other people. And Naomi is able to go, my life may be tragic, my life may be hard, but I want to help you at least. And looks outward to the good that she can do. Not just in Moab, but even when they get back and being so proactive with trying to help Ruth know what to do. You look at the story of Ruth. You know, what do we learn about the story when we look at Ruth? And one of the most powerful things is she has this courageous loyalty to do something, to follow and say, I am with you, Naomi, I love you, and I am going to stay with you. I know it's hard, I know it is not normal, but I am going to stay with you, I'm going to care for you. Where you go, I go. Where you die, I die. That level of loyalty, but also your people will be my people and your God will be my God. The Moabite. Back in the stories of Israel, the Moabites, no Moabite was supposed to be able to become an Israelite for 10 generations. It was a curse that was pronounced upon them. 10 generations. And so it should have been impossible for a Moabite 
But through the story of Ruth, what we see is anyone, even a Moabite, anyone who demonstrates faith is welcome. Does not matter where they come from, does not matter what their story, anyone is capable to come to faith and to show incredible faith and to step into that faith. This is what we see through Ruth and Boaz. We don't just see somebody who is kind, we see somebody who is intentional with his kindness. The easy thing for Boaz in this story, when he hears about Ruth and he sees Ruth gathering grain, is to simply look at his workers and go, oh, okay, yeah, she's nice. Don't bother her. And goes back home. That's the easy kindness to do. But Boaz goes the next step. He knows life is hard for her. He knows it's extra hard. And so Boaz goes the extra step to encourage her, goes the extra step to invite her in to eat with him. So my question is, who do you identify with the most in this story? I think sometimes we can go, right now life is hard, it is, I'm not sure what's going on, and I feel kind of like Naomi. So what would God have me do? What is the faithfulness? What is the new step of faith that God, the faithfulness to show, the kindness to show to other people? Where, where would he have me move? Sometimes that faithfulness and that new is just, even though it doesn't make sense, it doesn't feel right, it feels like God has abandoned me, the hard step is to go, I'm gonna stick with God anyway. And I'm gonna lean into what it means to be faithful to him. I'm gonna lean in to still be kind. I'm gonna to choose to be kind. I'm gonna to choose to do what's best for other people even though life is hard right now. Maybe you feel like Ruth and you're, and you're like, I don't feel like I have a place. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. And God's message would be, you're invited anyway. I see you differently. And to have that courageous loyalty to a friend, to a loved one who is going through a rough time. And maybe you're like Boaz and life is pretty good. Life isn't hard. You would say life is okay and, and you know, in life God is taking care of me and I'm in a good place right now. The challenge is, what, what is the challenging kindness not the easy kindness, but what is the hard thing that God wants you to step into? That new. And show the faithfulness and the loyalty. God works best through the faithful endurance of his children. Not just in the big miracles. Here's the thing. God performs these big miracles. He does these big things in Exodus, you know, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, and in Joshua. He does these big things, and everybody goes, yes, we will follow you. Yes, you will be great. And in the next chapter, guess what happens? They turn their back and walk away. God's best work happens through the faithfulness of his people. Day in and day out when life is hard, when it is inconvenient to do the right thing, to do the good that we know, but man, my schedule is busy. To move forward, to be challenged, to be uncomfortable for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of somebody else who needs encouragement and love in kindness, and God has placed you in their path. His faithfulness and our faithfulness, not just my personal, but our faithfulness together. This story doesn't happen unless Naomi and Ruth and Boaz are all faithful, moving in the same direction, and, and God uses all this faithfulness to weave this together. And he does something great because here's the, 
secret. The story of Ruth is not just the story of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. The end of the book ends with the genealogy that leads to King David. Ruth and Boaz are David's great-grandparents. Their faithfulness and what God does through their faithfulness is something even greater. The story isn't just about them and what God can make for them. And I think as Americans, a lot of time, we get so self-focused in our faith that I think about my faith and my faithfulness is all about the blessing that God is going to give me. But the truth is, God uses our faithfulness, not just, yeah, life is better for me when I'm following God, but what God wants to do through you in the next generation, in the next generation, in the little steps of faithfulness, day by day, is so much larger than any miracle that that usually we even pray for. I bet you've never heard the name Edward Kimball. Okay? Edward Kimball. That's because he was this guy on the East Coast. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was a cobbler. He made and fixed shoes, okay, um, in this small church. And beautiful story, because there was a bunch of rowdy boys in his town. And he felt the God leading him to care for these rowdy boys. And he ministered, he worked with them, he reached out to them and became his Sunday school class. And he worked hard and he loved and made it a huge deal that I want these boys to know they are loved and that God loves them and he worked with them. And one of these boys was Dwight L. Moody. D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody became this wonderful preacher Powerful evangelist in our world. Thousands, preached to thousands and thousands. And one of the people that came to Christ through his evangelism campaigns was Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman was another, became an evangelist and would do these revivals. And Billy Sunday was another guy who came to faith. And then he started to be an evangelist and went all over and preaching to thousands. Billy Sunday, there's Mordecai Ham, another preacher that came through. And guess who came to Christ through one of Mordecai Ham's revivals? A man named Billy Graham. But it started with a shoemaker who was a Sunday school teacher of a bunch of rowdy teen, like junior high boys. It started with his faithfulness. And this is the same thing in the story of Ruth. Sometimes it is hard to keep going. Sometimes it is hard to get out of bed and come to church on Sunday morning. Sometimes it is hard to make it a point to be there with your microchurch. And sometimes it's hard to be there even with your family. And God says, keep trusting because your faithful endurance is meaningful. You may not see it today, but what God does with the faithfulness of his church, when we together are faithful, we love one another and we keep moving forward. No matter our condition, he is able to do something beautiful. And sometimes I don't see it, but somebody down the road will. What is the new that God is calling you to to embrace? A new step of faith, a new, you know, being part of a group, sharing faith with somebody, loving your neighbor, whatever that is, whatever it looks like. My prayer is this year, as we start this new year, that as a church family, not individuals, but as a church family, we will be willing to step into new things, to hard things, and just watch what God and his spirit does through our faithfulness. Because it is a beautiful thing that we can see. Let's pray together.
Father God, this morning as we start a new year, January 1st, and all we think of all the potential that there is and all the things that might be done, whether it be work or school or all the different changes and in, in, in relationships and, and different things and um, it can it can be challenging and it can be daunting and to think and as so we think you know the the new habits the new things we want to see in our lives father this morning my prayer is that we would not leave you out of those future plans. We would not leave you to the side, but that we would start by asking, what is the new? Where is the new opportunity? Where is the growth area? Where is, what is it that you would have me do? No matter where we find ourselves, whether it's like Naomi or Ruth or Boaz, that we would have the courage we would have the boldness to step in, to be willing to be uncomfortable, to be willing to show incredible loyalty to you, incredible loyalty to one another and to Christ. And even when it gets hard, that you give us the energy we need, you give us just the extra nudge and the extra love to keep moving forward because the world is hurting. You have called us to care for this world and to bring Jesus to them. So Father, my prayer is that you would you would move in us, in our hearts, to be prepared for the new. And that we, we, we would go into it with joy, with enthusiasm, trusting in you. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.